Hello everybody, this is Cameron Snow with Dynomics.com. In this video, I'm going to be reviewing Dynomics' new 1D geomechanical earth model. So if you're not familiar with uh, mechanical earth models, the idea behind them is that you would like to calculate the rock strength properties so that you can start to get a better feeling for things like uh, wellbore stability and where there may be potential uh, failures in your wellbore. Uh, so to get started, um, you know, you, you need to make sure that you have a, um, a shear log available. Um, if you have, if you don't have a shear log that has, uh, that, that was logged with your well, remember you can always use dynamic shear log modeling toolbox, which will allow you to generate a synthetic, uh, shear log that you can use in this analysis. So once you've done that and you've, uh, you feel like you've got a, a good handle on your shear log. Um, we'll automatically calculate things like the Young's modulus, bulk modulus, shear modulus, and Poisson's ratio for you. Uh, you should have also already uh, evaluated your pore pressure uh, using Dynamics pore pressure module, where you could use things like the Eaton or modified Eaton methods for sonic resistivity or the Popilski method uh, for, for evaluating pore pressure. Uh, it's in those modules where you also will have already set your um, your hydrostatic pressures and your uh, overburden pressures. So once you've done that, you're ready to begin. Uh, there are really uh, three things that you need to do as kind of prerequisites for this. You need to convert your dynamic Young's modulus to a static Young's modulus. You need to uh, determine the unconfined compressive strength uh, for your rocks, and you need to uh, evaluate the internal friction angle for your for your rocks. So um, there are a number of ways you can do this. Um, almost all of these are uh, methods that are empirical correlations, and that have the, and therefore you would need to tie these to uh, rock strength data. So you go out, you would do your geomechanical test or you do you know tri things like triaxial failure tests on your on your rocks to evaluate these properties and then you would calibrate it um, in that well so you could then extrapolate it to other wells um, so let's look at some of the methods so for the static young's method um, we have a number of methods built in uh, methods from Christaris et al isa and kazi lacy king norn wang uh, a couple of different methods by broughtons and his colleagues uh, methods by Najibi and Van Heerden. So we have nine different methods in total built in. Uh, these are valid over uh, different um, ranges of Young's modulus. Uh, I tend myself to go with the either Christaris or Isa and Kazi methods uh, because these um, are very robust correlations that tend to cover a very large uh, range of pressures. Um, one thing to note is that in the literature you'll see that King's 1983 method has been used. Please note that that method was designed for uh, igneous and metamorphic rocks predominantly and really should only be used um, you know when evaluating uh, Young's moduli that are greater than 40 gigapascals. Um, you will often get very poor results uh, below that. So it's important to pay attention to the calibration ranges on these methods. Uh, if, you, um, if you'd like to learn more about these methods, uh, there was a good paper by Broughtons et al. in 2015 about improving the correlations between uh, static Young modulus and dynamics and dynamic Young's modulus. So I, I would encourage you to take a look at those. Okay, so uh, once, you, once you've set your static Young's modules, you'll need to determine a method for looking at the unconfined compressive strength. Uh, we have built in 17 uh, different uh, correlations for this. Um, once again, these are predominantly empirical correlations. Uh, these were outlined extensively in uh, Chang et al's uh, 2006 summary paper um, where they evaluated a number of these uh, against core. They have all the equations outlined in there, so I would definitely recommend you to check that out as a reference. Um, and for these, uh, most of the time, 
there is both a location and a lithology that is set along with the method. So for example, we have Freyberg, uh, his 1972 study done in the uh, Turing Basin in Germany and that was focused on sandstones. We have uh, McNally 1987 and he was focused on sandstones in Australia and sandstones in the Gulf Coast. Um, you know, so there, there are a number of these. There are a few of them that are global. So these are researchers that looked at global data sets uh, such as Bradford uh, and Vernick et al. Um, so we, there's also a few methods that are focused on shells such as Hosrud's study and a few that are focused on limestones and dolomites uh, such as uh, Golubev and Rabinovich and Rzevsky and Novik. Um, so these are highly lithology dependent. So once again, I strongly encourage you to uh, take care when setting these and understand the limitations on these methodologies. And finally, you'll need to set the internal friction angle. Uh, there are three correlations built in uh, for this. Uh, there's Law 1999, Weingarten and Perkins, uh, for sandstone and a uh, Weingarten and Perkins uh, mixed lithology. So um, you, once you set those, uh, you'll have calculated your unconfined compressive strength and your internal friction angle. You've already converted your static or your dynamic Young's modulus to a static Young's modulus. And then you'll need to set your methods for your minimum and maximum horizontal stresses. Uh, in the literature, what you'll see is that uh, most of the emphasis has been put on calculating the minimum horizontal stress. Uh, this is the one that is, is much more um, widely understood. Uh, so a handful of methods there, such as uh, Hubert and Willis, 1957. Uh, probably the most popular methods are uh, Eaton's methods. This is the same Eaton that did all the pore pressure work, and there's also Holbrook, 1990. Uh, the one method here that requires some additional information is Eaton in his uh, 19, there's a, essentially a modification on his 1969 paper where it uses the uh, Biot method in combination with uh, user inputs for the, uh, the tectonic stress component. And so uh, if you select that method, you'll also need to uh, select the method for calculating Biot's coefficient. Uh, we have two methods for that, which are Wu 2011 and Kreef 1990. Uh, both those provide uh, very similar answers uh, based on the uh, correlation to porosity. Once again, another empirical correlation. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to uh, just go back to the Eaton method here because uh, I, I don't have a good handle on where that minimum horizontal stress should be set for uh, for this particular area. And then for the maximum horizontal stress, uh, three methods available to us. We have uh, two methods by Addis, 1996, or Addis and his colleagues, I should say, um, which one is set up for normal faulting and one is set up for strike slip faulting. Uh, so, you know, select the regime that is more appropriate to you there. Or you could also look at uh, once again, that modified Eaton method that's based on the Biot coefficient. Um, the key here is you need to set the magnitude of that uh, of that maximum horizontal stress. So if we select that, we'll get the additional pop-up menu once again to calculate the Biot's coefficient, and this time to calculate the uh, tectonic stress um, in the maximum direction. And so remember your if we set both of these, um, we need to make sure that our that our uh, tectonic stress in the maximum horizontal direction is greater than our tectonic stress in the minimum horizontal direction. Uh, now, it could be an isotropic system, in which case these would be uh, set identically with one another. Okay, so, but for now, I'm just going to use some methods that don't involve those. Okay, so that is... Th those are the options that need to be set. Um, so let's look at our tracks uh, real quickly. So we have a gamma ray track just for reference. Then we have a caliper track where we have a mirrored view of the caliper. And this is to help us see where our well bore is engaged and where our well bore uh, has been suffering from washouts. So we can see here in this well at the base of this shell and at the top of the Alston chalk. And here in the middle of the Alston chalk, we've seen uh, washouts and those washouts they, they could be due to uh, 
you know, drilling uh, parameters, but it could also be due, you know, to the fact that maybe our uh, mud weight, uh, you know, was a bit too low, and we actually see that, uh, you know, we have, you know, uh, some either tensile failures or wellbore breakouts as a result of that. Um, and then we have our moduli that have been calculated here for us. Um, note these are the dynamic moduli, uh, but often they, these are uh, a good quick look indicator of, of rock strength. And then we have our, uh, our uh, overburden pressure and pore pressure from, from the pore pressure module displayed. And then we also have our SH max and SH min, so that is our uh, maximum and minimum horizontal strength shown in blue and green respectively. Um, and then uh, for convenience, we also convert this to pounds per gallon for you. Uh, and that's because, you know, drillers often work in pounds per gallon. So you'll often get your mud weight curves uh, in, in pounds per gallon. So what is it you should be looking for on these tracks? So first of all, as a QC method, you should make sure that your minimum and maximum horizontal stresses uh, are either equal or that your maximum horizontal stress is greater, sometimes significantly greater, depending on the uh, tectonic regime that you're in. So important to get that set uh, correctly. Um, and you, you should also start to look to see if, uh, especially if you have mud weight data, you know, are there areas where, you know, your your mud weight either falls significantly below your pore pressure? Uh, if so, that could be a sign that um, that you may be uh, prone to having uh, blowouts in the well uh, due to pore pressure. These can be uh, quite dangerous. It's important to understand that. Um, also, if your mud weight starts to exceed uh, your minimum and maximum horizontal stresses, this can actually either lead to uh, compressive breakouts or tensile uh, failure within your wellbore, um, which can lead to, um, you know, having an enlarged wellbore. It can also cause uh, wellbore stability problems, lead to things like stuck drill pipe, and uh, can make it difficult to get casing into your well. Um, so. So this is uh, important to work with. Please note that for right now, we are considering this uh, only for the case of vertical wells. Um, we anticipate uh, before the end of 2020 that we will have this in for um, deviated uh, wells also. And uh, once that is the case, there will be a few additional parameters uh, to be set, um, but overall the methods available will still largely uh, be the same. Uh, if you have any questions on this, uh, please contact me at support at and we'll be happy to help as best we can. Thank you.